Muchas gracias a nuestros panelistas y a nuestra moderadora Ana Velasco por este, por este panel sobre justicia climática. Nos compartieron perspectivas, experiencias, herramientas sobre la justicia ambiental y la justicia climática, así como casos de referencia y alternativas para hacerla efectiva. Continuamos con el programa de este segundo foro internacional, la innovación en la justicia. Tendremos ahora el panel Redes Sociales e Impartición de Justicia, Aplicación de la Ley Social la Media and the Administration este panel Justice, estará moderado por Patricia Dovesa, Facilitated by Laida Patricia de Obeso, we will have Laida Negrete, researcher and producer of the documentary Anel Pineda Marín, Presunto Culpable, Anel Pineda Marín, a lawyer and representative in the case Arturo Angel, Justice for Inés, Arturo Angel, journalist from Animal Político, and Alfredo Lecona, activist, actor, and journalist for the Café de la Mañana. El uso de las redes sociales en la They will talk about the topic on justice. Las redes sociales como nuevo mecanismo social de media and the application of y la viralización de información. Law and the legalization común. of information. Le damos the citizenship la as a the judge. And we welcome all of you. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone that is seeing us today who were able to connect to this space, I am very lucky to facilitate this, con this conversation with four people with different and complementary profiles for this topic, talking about something very relevant that is happening right now while we talk, which is irrelevant for justice or injustice for today, which is social media. In one hour, we will try to explore the role that social media have today in the perception of the administration of justice or in the true administration of it, how to manage this tension if the rights are being violated, if justice becomes more expedite because of social media with the social outrage that we see. And the methodology is very simple. We have a bit less than an hour so that we can have these dialogues with our speakers who were already introduced and I would like to give them the floor already. So I'm going to ask the first question, the first trigger question. Each of you will have five minutes and then we will do a second round with a second question to respond the, to the presentations of our colleagues. The first question that I would like to start with Laida, then Arturo and Nelly, and then Alfredo. The first question is, our justice structure is moving from the public perception of the viralization of cases, yes or not? And if this violates rights such as privacy and the status of innocence and in other approaches to other things in Mexico. We start with you, Laida. Your microphone is on mute. Thank you. I'm Laida Negrete. I'm one of the producers of Presunto Culpable, also one of the producers of Duda Razonable. And it's an honor for me to be here in this panel with, so, with people that I admire so much and to talk about these justice procedures in Mexico. I think that this panel is a good opportunity to talk about how citizens can gather tools that are not the institutional tools or the tools that the governments provide in order to try and have justice and compensate the inequality or the lack of access to justice. So in my personal experience, uh, with this movie was to take a camera and picture a process 
that had not reached the media that was not seen by the, by the press. And it was a routine case. So through different stories, I wanted to make it relevant. And it's not only to discuss a specific case, but to, to see the deficiencies of a, a system. This was a presunto culpable or presumed guilty, the movie. And we are about to launch a new series called Duda Razonable, a reasonable doubt, which is a mini series that will be launched on November 26th in Netflix. And once again, it's about giving light to a case. In this case, it's a case in Macuspana, Tabasco. This was a follow-up that started by Roberto Hernandez, the director since 2015. And it's a case that is actually alive. And I think that this helps us discuss these topics because since this is a current case and we believe this is some injustice against four people with low income for them to be heard, we did a mini series of four episodes in a world global platform in order to give light to this case and demand that there is a, a response by the justice system. And it started with just a small crash in a gas station in Ciudad Pemex in Macuspana, Tabasco. And then it goes through a suspicion of two kidnaps and many years in prison. And this is a situation that is very complicated and it's possible to generate a documentary miniseries that traps us and that takes us through every episode to give light to it. So what are the questions that we established throughout this documentary? For instance, the alleged victims of these kidnaps, how are we treating them? We have the records, the videos of these trials because we can record them now and the audience will be able to see how they are, how this trial is being done in this process. And it's a follow-up of different of different years. And during this jury trial, the identity of the victims is being preserved. And the first question is, how are we gonna do this? How, what is the treatment that we're going to do? Who is going to protect the victim? So I think that I would like to leave some questions that I can discuss later in presumed guilty, the key witness of the of the case placed an action against us saying that we were saying something and we went to the Supreme Court to say if a witness has the right to this privacy. I think that today we know we need to ask who has the obligation to protect them and how these external cases can show us the protection of personal information. And with this, I will conclude. Now, Arturo, I'm sorry, what was the question? Because I was really into Laida's answer that I got distracted. Yes, Laida started talking about the tools that are given by having a documentary and how to reach this inequality in justice. And the question as we had it is if our justice system is moving from the public per perception, from this social outrage and from cases becoming viral. And if it does, if this is violating rights such as privacy and presumption of innocence, such as the case of presumed guilty. So this is what we would like to analyze. Well, first of all, I would say two things. The first one that maybe does not respond to your specific question, but then I will go into that. But first of all, I would only say that one of the advantages that we have right now that didn't exist when presumed guilty was launched is that hearings are public. 
And I think it's one of the great pending items that we have in the media and in general society. I think that we have not taken advantage of the opportunity that we have of going to hearings to see how our justice system works, to see what judges say, to see how the district attorneys work. I don't know if someone, someone has try to go to a hearing to see how it is for a person who is accused of a robbery or of someone who is charged for murder, those types of things, to see the nuances and the difference between someone who has a public attorney and someone else who has a private attorney. I think it would be an amazing exercise. And I think that journalists should be interested in that but actually it can be done by anyone. And in the previous criminal system, we didn't have that. So this is one of the things that I think with this revolution that we had with different factors and one of the things that we could see in presumed guilty is that we're moving towards that. And how, however, I think this is an option that we have not used enough in society and in the media. And at the same time, since it's not being leveraged, it has created this behavior of our justice system of wanting to be closed again. So maybe this should not be so advertised and they are trying to find ways to make it more difficult to have access to these areas that we had opened before. And also, I think we are moving towards a warranty criminal system where we talk about presumption of innocence and before the lack of reliability that we had because of the investigations in Mexico, we didn't trust in the public prosecution and we had to create a system in which part of this investigation is under the uh, guardianship of, of a judge and we also added prison and that's what you were talking about at the beginning i do think that the authorities along with the media many times and maybe the media because we are ignorant or because we do not we do not know about something or maybe because we want to do it we have contributed to selling this idea of justice and not a real justice we have studied that recently. Well, we have investigated about it in Animal Politico. I th remember that three years ago, we published a report called Matar en Mexico. And I don't forget that this was about a judge that criticized how the investigations were really bad. He said, these are a disaster. This is embarrassing and how you are doing it. But in the end, this judge sent people to jail and the he sent to jail the presumed guilty and I asked him why. And he said, do you think I'm going to be the judge that left this alleged murder free? And this is just because this uh, presumed uh, guilty person had gone through a through a media uh, prosecution where they were presented to the media like that and the media were selling this idea without any type of self-criticism and violating the presumption of innocence. I thought that this was left behind and we were moving towards a new criminal system, but I'm finding the same thing. We may not sell the photograph or we do not present the alleged guilty and we sell this as a synonymous of justice and we are selling this from the headquarters of the president and but we are also replicating that in the media and people indeed believe that if you are not in jail you are not paying for a crime you did so i think that we are creating this image of justice as a punishment and that's what this creates that's what creates this type of situations. Thank you, Arturo Angel. Hello, good afternoon. It is a pleasure for me to be here with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. 
First of all, I would like to talk about this presumption of innocence because it is a right indeed, but it also establishes rules of treatment. The court has started about it and they have established it in different areas. Presumption of innocence establishes the rules on how the person needs to be treated. They need to be treated as the perpetrator of this crime. Maybe they should not be presented in front of the media. Their image should not be out there. The authorities should not present their information. They cannot be penalized before uh, with different measures and also establish different rules on how to determine what is the evidence that will determine this um, this ruling and to see if these evidences are used to arrange the way this case is going to be analyzed from the judicial authorities, but also from the way in which they should work, in which they should investigate and present the evidences in the public prosecution agencies. So that's where the rules of presumption of innocence are. I would I like to talk about social media as a great stadium where we have a lot of people from different ages, criteria and religions, but in a stadium where not everyone fits because there are people who are left outside of that stadium, out of that social media. The last branch service said, I think, that there are around 100 million profiles in social media active in Mexico right now. So let's assume that we have 100 million people but we are not 100 million. We are 129 million people, I think, in this city. So there are people that are outside. And within the social media, there are people that have a better scope than others. And some people within this stadium can communicate something and can only tell it to the, the, the people next to them. And some people will be able to reach half of the stadium and some people will be able to reach the screens that are projecting to the whole stadium. But that does not change the rules of the game that is being played down there. You may think about whatever sports match you want. In the field, the rules are the same and they do not change or they should not change according to the noise that is around the match and how much people can communicate or not. The thing is that it is actually having an influence. Sometimes it is for good and sometimes it is for wrong. As Angel was saying, it could be that a judicial authority rules this by violating the presumption of innocence because the, here it's being violated if the judge the, or the person that is ruling it's taking a resolution based on the evidence, not based on the presumption of innocence, but what they are perceiving in society. So who is violating this presumption of innocence are the people around it who are, are not the people around it who are discussing this topic, but the judicial authority who is not applying the rules of the game. It's, it's as if we thought that the referee in a soccer match is deciding according to the people yelling in the stadium in order to to say if there was a a fault in during the match so i think it is important to separate this topic of presumption of innocence and also the pinpointing that people can do through social media of one case or another case if we focus this debate according to the games of the rule, the, re the rules of the game beyond the people, beyond the media, uh, if the judges, in this case, the referee is acting according to the rules, then I think that we could have a more fruitful debate for everyone. But also I think that it would allow us, allow us to say if the actions of these authorities are appropriate and that can be shown to everyone. I think I can leave my comment here. 
Thank you, Anel. It's very interesting to see the different points of view in this first round. Thank you, Patty. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here with people that I admire and care about a lot. I think that they are titans in what they do, and I am very happy to be able to share this here in such a way that this conversation sends me to the interest that I can have in justice or how this uh, presumed guilty movie, of course, changed my whole perception that I had on justice in our country. And the things that Laida mentioned with these institutional tools, the fact that we have this evolution from this type of application of the justice and to put it into public scrutiny. And I think that we are not free from those vices. And I totally agree with the analysis that Anel did of this great stadium. And to answer the question, I would say, I think in presumed guilty, and I think of the amount of evidence and things that we could see there of something that was not fair. And it was documented by a case of extraordinary people such as Laida, who did this documentary. And I think about what we saw a few weeks ago and the power that one photograph has of one alleged criminal, a white neck a criminal, as some people would say. This was Emilio Lozoya. This was a picture taken by one journalist to show this icon of impunity that Emilio Lozoya became because of reasons that I may not address here, but that definitely represented something for Mexican society. This was something that Mexican society was angry about and the capability that it has to activate different mechanisms of justice or to make changes in different things that we saw just because we, sh we saw that picture. So social media have closed the gap of what can be communicated in all senses and to outrage the Mexican society. And Mexico Evalua has done a great job in the findings saying that impunity is 95%, but I don't think it's, possible, it's necessary for most Mexicans to have the number or the figure to know that justice in Mexico does not work, to know that in Mexico there are crimes there are murders and all types of things because it is allowed and because people can do it. And I would like to connect this with the reflection that Arturo made by the end of his intervention, because yes, I do think that a justice that comes uh, from the people is being built. I'm not trying to blame social media of everything that is happening. There has always been this pressure from the media. There has always there have always been media that for good or for bad, as Arturo said, are working jointly with the justice institutions to create this anger. And I think that the way this is moving forward with the presidential speech is being really, really large. And I am concerned about the, about two things, the Pandora case that was open with this modification to the 19 article that brings us to this really, really sad situation of preventive custody. And we are always uh, hearing about uh, the, that the poor go first. And I think that we have this construction of prison, of severe crimes, of putting every criminals in prison, and do not ask ourselves if there is something that is not correct when prisons are full and there's still impunity of 95%. So this is something that is happening in an environment such as social media are presenting, because this is the new stadium or the new the public forum. And just to finish off, my first presentation, the phenomenon of the militarization. I think that both preventive custody and this militarization, I put in this revenge topic of punishment that goes beyond any 
rational or a serious analysis that we need to do for our justice system. I would leave that as my, my first reflection. And once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Alfredo. I think that there is clearly a consensus that social media are a tool and they are making things move. The problem is the nuances that there are and that there is no consensus of who is receiving this pressure and how they receive, how the judges or the legislators are receiving this pressure and what they do about it regarding, for instance, preventive custody or the idea that being in prison means justice. So the next question that I wanted to ask you, and it's kind of also open for you to, to react or complement your first intervention, is what is the role of the lawmakers, I mean, also judges and the public prosecutors before social media? I mean, turn them off and don't listen to them or how to incorporate them into this idea. As you were saying, this is a new reality. Pressure, public pressure has always been there, but how to approach a new agreement in such a way that they are not damaging and that they are contributing with something. So what could be the role that these that lawmakers and judges need to have before social media. Laida, please. This is a great question. What should judges and lawmakers do? I think that any space of debate has the potential of damaging, of damaging and of helping. I believe more in a self-regulation, that we discuss the way we are doing it today, what are the problems and the boundaries, more than trying to establish general boundaries. I don't think this is something that can be regulated, because what's interesting of these cases is to see that from a specific context and case. So I want to go back to the case of presumed guilty because many of us saw this movie and then we did not see the, the aftermath. There were two claims in important places. One was the witness, which was the key witness according to, to the case, or he thought that Tonio Zuniga had shot the victim. And we never asked that person their permission for him to be recorded. And we had the permission of the court and from the prison, but we never asked him. So he went to trial saying that he was not asked for permission and he had his right to privacy. And we said, yes, you have the right to privacy, but there is also this right to making things public. So what is more important? So two of the, both of them are basic rights. So we said, in this case, you have right to privacy, but we didn't re uh, we didn't film you in your house, in your bathroom, or in your bedroom. We filmed you in a criminal trial, in a criminal procedure that the Constitution says must be public. And you are not a person uh, in that moment. You are an evidence, so to speak. You are like an evidence that is being brought to the case. So this trial could not be public if we start removing this evidence. And there are so many witnesses and so many experts that we cannot take them out from that place where they are establishing something as evidence. That's the argument, but uh, the argumentation and both of them are good and it's not clear what is going to happen until it reached the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court established the criteria that this is a case where the public part of this should prevail. But this was a divided decision. Not even in the Supreme Court, they said, yes, it's very clear and the people from the movie are right or it was not as the witness is right. There was also another case 
the family of the victim in a certain moment for a few seconds there is an image of the body and the family said you have no right to present the victim in your images and i think that this is a very good question as well it's true there is something very delicate and when we checked the criteria that the journalists use on showing dead bodies for instance they talk about this self-regulation this self-censorship and there is also one case that i really liked and they said the for the dead body try not to do it try not to show a human body but sometimes it's necessary and i think about this image that was important for all of us of a the body of a dead child a child from Syria who was dead on the beach. It was his body lying on the beach. And that puts everyone in this sense of emergency. It started moving people. So it depends on the place and the, or the situation. And with the last minute, minute that I have left, a uh, the other, the series, Duda Razonable, is launched on November 23rd on Netflix, and there are going to be new questions. Is these recordings that we have from the public hearings and jury trials, which is just very few for the lack of investigation, the lack of quality of the judges in terms of seeing the deficiencies of the public prosecutors, as you mentioned, but who has the right to show those recordings and how? and we are using them and we edit them and we did everything and everything that and another thing that i also mentioned is what was the treatment that we gave to the victims that by law they had this privacy and i invite you to see it to discuss it and to question it as well in social media so that we can continue with this conversation that i think is very important thank you very much navidad arturo there are several things here. First of all, what uh, what my colleagues have said is very interesting publicity in hearings. I think that uh, one of uh, the big outstanding issues we have, I'm, inter I'm interested in what Leida said because I would like to know how the recordings of uh, those uh, hearings are used, because we have uh, this formula in our criminal system, which is logical. If you go, you can uh, see the public hearing, but uh, reproduction is forbidden unless you're part thereof. Even for uh, transparency, uh, for transparency purposes, you can say, okay, I want to uh, show uh, a picture of the parties of the hearing because I'm writing this chronicle. No, you can't because the National Code of uh, Criminal Procedures that only parties have a uh, right to the audio and video. That's the reason why when you go as public well, like media, we go as a uh, uh, public to the hearings. You cannot go there with anything, sometimes not even with your pen because they are terrified that they're going to re record something and uh, reproduce it later on. I think that sometimes the federal judiciary gave me the uh, copy of uh, an audio and video of Javier Duarte, but because the case uh, was completely uh, state, uh, but the images were blurred, uh, and it was only audio. Sometimes the videos, of course, we obtain videos of hearings because, you know, uh, the attorneys, because the authorities can uh, fail to them, but you can't reproduce them or in a, me in a specific medium, or it would depend on the circumstances, and it should not be the case. That's one uh, big topic that is uh, not going to be solved today, but it's one of the main outstanding uh, issues. And uh, now the topic of media Alfredo said something that really caught my attention, and is that uh, when we speak the way in which uh, uh, others just have to behave uh, before uh, media. It's actually uh, before people because it's not that uh, Twitter decides to tweet uh, anything. It's people. I know we've got uh, bots and all that, but these are people. And what happens now is that we have uh, a larger resonance of what's and what you know. The time it would take uh, it would take you, you know, to be 
concerned about something when you were waiting for the next day's newspaper. It's not the same with the social media now. We have a more powerful tool right now. And uh, thanks to social media, it's actually before people that has now a very powerful tool, but it's still before people. And I think the challenge is there. And that's what I wanted to say for the first part of my intervention. And I go back to uh, this case, which is very popular and a very fresh one. Lothria did not uh, do anything illegal for going to the restaurant uh, and eating something there that was completely valid. And he was able to do that because he was not uh, breaching the measures that he was imposed when he decided not to, he really decided not to detain them. But it was illogical because I was in the hearing and I can tell you uh, this uh, hearing that it, uh, was the intermediate uh, hearing. Well, this was a, a hearing just to request for further time for the case. The hearing became a trial, uh, quotation marks, because of what why Lisa went to have a supper at the restaurant. That's what it was. And for the for the prosecution, they wanted to say that Lisa had had allowed himself to be a picture. Maybe I think that was a problem because he was a court, but he it was his right. So the judge did well when uh, he decided to have pretrial detention. He said, I'm not going to leave him in prison because he you were you went there. I'm going to leave him in prison because from last year, I think that you had to be in the prison, but the prosecutors did not ask for it. But see how the matter of social pressure was concerned because it's the prosecution that changed its attitude because uh, should that eviction not uh, uh, become uh, public, we would not have this hostile uh, attitude towards Emilio Lusaga. So uh, this became a scandal. And why? Because people saw his picture. But actually, we were tired of uh, journalists who were covering this. We were tired of saying that he had no uh, dummy side prison. We had published that he was not even going to sign. But we did not have the impact of that same picture. So that's an example of how a picture can create a social impact that not even media can create. This is going to make a scandal that is going to move an authority to behave differently in a judicial trial. And I think this is very concerning from the very first day we were saying the power of an image. But I'm very concerned that actually it's because of this type of appearances and impacts so how uh, social indignation has this, and then uh, the um, Mexican state uh, uh, machine is moved. Thank you, Arturo Annette. And that's the fear I wanted to uh, speak about because. Uh, and they said can do a lot, but that's not going to change the national code of uh, criminal procedures, nor international or domestic standards of due process. The rules did not change, as Arturo was saying. What changed is uh, the uh, equation, the authority, uh, people of uh, the public prosecutor's office, the agents of the state change the way in which they behave from what uh, they see in a social media, on social media, or the social perception that uh, we can have through social media. And it's here where the problem lies, I think, because the problem is not that people discuss and are subject to public scrutiny uh, for one case or another, but the problem is that uh, rules will not be applied any longer or that they are modified or to be stiffened or to be softened according to what each uh, state agent uh, public uh, prosecutor, uh, uh, the police, uh, each one is going to move or, uh, or change uh, rules as uh, they uh, see their feet according to their reaction on social media. That's the problem, that we aren't considering the authority with uh, uh, this uh, easiness. People do not understand that uh, authorities are changing so easily, and this should be justified. And uh, the judicial authority did not come out either to explain the reason for uh, their decision of this pretrial detention. And then we have another topic, which is that of the agent making 
uh, stipulations because uh, the lack of information is being filtered through speculations uh, like you know how a picture can take you or the fact that you are having a supper at an expensive restaurant can take you to uh, be in a, on a pre-trial detention but this lack of information is not filled in by the authority the authority is not used to come out and explain it's acting it's not used to be transparent in its acting why because evidently being transparent being accountable explaining resolutions and explaining them in a way that can be understood by everyone with all of uh, the technicism that sometimes do not allow you to say anything uh, uh, but actually this can really explain the reasonings and uh, the arguments uh, by which uh, one decision is made or not and the authority do not does not want to do this what happens with uh, what society uh, well, they maintain uh, the specul these speculations, and we have uh, misunderstandings uh, that uh, aren't addressed by the authorities, and we have a myriad of uh, problems because this is going to take us to media, media trials and people trials, uh, uh, and which are based on people and not on rules and the way in which uh, the authorities are applying them. In the case of Liliana and Inez, I think that uh, the organizations which uh, uh, were there for this case, we were interested at all times uh, in making sure that the rules that were not being complied with uh, uh, were visible in that investigation, which uh, the failures of uh, the public prosecutor's office to wear, which were visible at the time in which this was being presented during the hearing. So we have to focus and we have to be very uh, precise uh, on the fact that what we've got to discuss about is how the authority is applying a rule, in which cases it is applying it uh, in a a softened way because this is a person with a great social impact, a famous person, or whatever, or when it is being applied in a stiffened way to uh, punish the fame of that, that same fame of that person. So in here, the matter is to question the authorities and uh, their acting because the rules are there. And from my point of view, the legislator and uh, le legislatures actually have no uh, acting benchmark because the rules are there. We have state agents who are applying, uh, executing them according to the public perception. Thank you very much, uh, Anel Alfredo. You're muted, Alfredo, I'm afraid. Oh, a classic, right? If this is not a heaven and a firm, there is no forum at all. Well, to well, what do legislators have to do? Well, let me tell you what they don't have to do. They have to stop proposing stupidities. And I'm saying this in this way because I have lost uh, the notion of how many anti-meme uh, uh, cybersecurity initiatives they have tried to advance at the Congress with the pretext of social media. And I go back to what I was saying during my first intervention. It's very easy to uh, find uh, uh, the, a villain and to make them accountable. As we were saying here, they are just uh, the reflection of our society. I think that society has to move and has to change to, because of uh, social media, because of immediacy, of, uh, because of the immediacy of information, because of what a picture can uh, cause, uh, versus uh, uh, the, the the work for a doc for a documentary, uh, but that's the reflection of uh, the society and legislators should not uh be there uh, trying to sell this to us and i remember they were i remember how uh, when these initiatives so started to uh, arise and what uh, justice administrators and actors have to do well they have to be clear <laughs> for what they, they've got to speak spanish because um uh, legal 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 spanish well it has got uh, also permitted to the to social onto social media uh, it's been centuries of uh, justice and writing of uh, these uh, 
uh, ink labyrinths uh, of writing machines and physical uh, files. And uh, if we see this as, uh, as, I don't know if you have seen uh, the Supreme Court of Justice uh, mural, which is very iconic uh, by Rafael Cavuro, uh, you have the justice literally defeated, uh, violated, subject to files and social media are completely the opposite uh, they will present um, a, um, a, a, a dynamics something as simple as to file a, a suit a complaint and sometimes it can even be a snowball of things then that perception of justice of uh, uh, even social and moral punishment. The president says it's uh, a way more, and we've got a president saying that beyond uh, uh, the sentence uh, for uh, the Brecht, when he's, uh, more, he's more concerned about uh, things being uh, known. That's what I was saying. What the people uh, say, what uh, the, 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 passion, the people's passion to speak for one or two days about a topic. For many, uh, this is the perception that justice was made or not. And in here, we have very uh, deep topics like uh, those of uh, uh, pre-trial detention, like in the case of Lasoya, but a case which was uh, born on social media and that has implications that I would have loved to discuss further, like Yosto, like the case of Yosto YouTuber, because she was a case for uh, uh, pu uh, publishing uh, images and beyond and the non-respect of uh, privacy, but of course, privacy of social media, we're going to see this when uh, the uh, world in writing of a justice that is uh, uh, struggling to adapt to the news times and uh, the new times and what they are setting for this especially for these ways of uh, uh, these new and more dynamic ways of communication as to uh, create or uh, uh, social media should be that vehicle as to have access to the appropriate uh, and unmanipulated information. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, vendetta thirst, uh, that uh, hard hand uh, speech is uh, um, uh, jeopardizing uh, the existence of a dialogue that will take us to have all of uh, these investigations and to focus on uh, what really matters. I know that social media themselves and uh, providers have uh, an accountability here, and we've got to speak about it. We've got to speak about how this has been allowed in other countries and in very specific uh, social media, the manipulation of information as uh, to uh, generate uh, a conversation which is fictitious and how for the construction that we have to understand as uh, justice. And I will stop here because I think that I have uh, speak way more than the time I had been allocated. It is a very fascinating speak. I think we could speak for another, uh, but since it is, we're running out of time, however, we have very good questions and I would like to read them for, uh, uh, for you. And we are not, we won't have time to go through all of them, but it's always to, uh, read some just to have some uh, uh, reflection matter. What happens in the case of disappearance uh, cases that become trending topics, uh, resource allocation for investigation so uh, that can uh, be influenced by social pressure? How can we speak about the right to oblivion in cases that are very visible and public in nature? Discretion spaces allowed by uh, laws open uh, opportunities up for social pressure to become a decisive uh, factor. Well, anyone, if, if you could take one or two minutes to answer, I think that in general you agree, right? That uh, this is a tool that has to be self regulated. However, you also uh, agree that it has some influence. And also, this uh, part, even Alfredo, you spoke about uh, this. We should not, uh, well, what the, the legislators should not do, or judges should not do. The reality is that uh, there is uh, some influence. And as Anel was saying, we have uh, this. Uh, uh, limited uh, uh, stage and who has access to the microphone and is going to scream uh, as it's uh, loud. I don't know if someone would like to uh, take the to accept the challenge of uh, answering in a couple of minutes for these appearances. Uh, what happens? Um, well, very, very little, almost nothing in terms of effective justice when uh, a case becomes very mediatic, of course, this is going to move the authorities to act. 
not just with the disappearances, but with many others. Uh, murders, very uh, fast attentions, and the authorities show uh, have an amazing uh, efficiency in uh, these cases. So the machine, uh, the Justice Administration uh, machine is moved because of the social impact. And yes, scandal moves things and the noise on social media or, or people in general is going to move the authorities to act indeed but oftentimes uh, this is just an impasse that is not the solution we have had a very serious disappearances but a very not so long ago we were publishing uh, about uh, the uh, topic of uh, uh, false disappearances uh, we worked on a uh, over 1,600 uh, files of investigation and none was solved. No uh, case made it to the, a trial. There is no uh, sentence to people. And we have never, we have not uh, built either the structure necessary because we can identify because that's we have this extraordinary number of disappeared people. Unfortunately, we do have uh, some movement because of a very um a specific case but uh in here we're just trying to uh distract it is just a diversion we also published uh, th things about uh, the army and money and uh, confidential agreements which we try to contain uh, the victims in this case and then that's the end of it i agree with arturo the Problem. Well, I will. I don't like to say problem. The crisis, the tragedy, the humanitarian tragedy of this country, with over one hundred thousand disappeared people, officially acknowledged. That is, it here where where social media, so the good side of social media can be seen. I too know not just one or two or three, several uh, cases of how we have found uh, living or dead people because of uh, 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 the cards that are start to be elaborated. This uh, it goes beyond our capacity of every at every level of any aspect about which we can uh, about which we can discuss. So we can uh, end uh, uh, with uh, this crisis. So the right to oblivion. I want to say that the right to oblivion does not exist. That's an invention of uh, lawyer firms that mainly are aiming at uh, erase some uh, evidence of uh, corrupt one. That's a he whole topic for which we don't have the time to uh, address, but we have uh, the right to oblivion, the so-called uh, right to oblivion. Uh, that's what it is. But um, this goes in uh, the right sense to be an incident or to uh, make uh, ev justice evident. Of course, that these are a perfect uh, means, uh, an appropriate means to do so. And the accountability here goes to individuals. I have always said, for good or for bad, we punish uh, themselves at the best we uh, or as we want. That's the message, my last message. One can decide what to say and what not to. And that's the question that we have all to uh, make. How uh, are responsible our use of social media and what we publish will be there. An L and then line uh, one and a half minutes. So uh, the streaming does not uh, cut mid sentence. Well, in this time, in these times of uh, uh, consolation, cons consolation cultures, someone was saying you have to make sure that you behave like a decent uh, human being at all times because you do not know when you are going to be recorded and then you're going to be cancelled on social media. And I would think that uh, all of the, the authorities, uh, uh, public prosecutors, uh, actors, judges, uh, the police, the enforcement uh, uh, a task they should behave like good authorities, good judges by complying with uh, rules because at all times, so all cases have the potential to be observed and uh, uh, 
uh, to reach the public eye and uh, to be uh, questioned. I hope that we will get to that uh, moment uh, at which uh, the authorities are also very concerned about their image and to comply with the rules. That's the point. Uh, just follow the already established rules. I know just in some cases in which this is a, a famous uh, YouTube or the one involved in uh, or in the cases in which we have an actor in a car accident, uh, uh, the rules are for everyone. Ida. Great. Well, I would like to say two things, one of which is in uh, in terms of, a bud of the budgets available for the different types of uh, uh, crimes or offenses uh, because of uh, the social um, unrest, I think there is a clear difference between specialized uh, offices that uh, work on uh, kidnapping cases and uh, though on those offices are devoted to disappearance cases, it's very sad to see that there is uh, a topic of class of lack of access, uh, which is uh, very evident and which concerns how there is a social perception that we can all be victims of a kidnapping, but we uh, do not all feel that we can be the victims of a forced uh, um, uh, here. But, uh, we are not making a favor. Uh, we are not making anyone a favor here when we do not uh, not consider the whole uh, seriousness as well as that bad institutional response and equal institutional response, right? And the other thing that I would like to say, just as uh, you know, just like a call, like a, uh, and like an idea to follow on which to follow up is that we have to. Uh, protect uh, the presumption of innocence in this way. We are made to go for the blood, to go for the sanctions. Psychologically, that's the way we are wired. And uh, it's more common to see a viralization when someone said, uh, they, uh, they're, um, you know, they're, uh, guilty instead of doing the same for some when someone's uh, uh, um, innocent so we have to protect uh, judges who are doing the right thing in terms of uh, establishing controls to the public prosecutor officers to the president to the president to the uh, federal state governors we have to protect that presumption of innocence and also in our speeches uh, that it's not just to go and punish but also to defend as well thank you very much well, thank you very much uh, uh, as to uh, Lionel Alfredo and El. This was a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much, Mexico Evalua, to invite us to share this space. Gracias. Thank you.